Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Hedy Lamar, Robert Young, and Josephine Hutchinson in H.M. Pullum Esquire. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. When H.M. Pullum Esquire started its best-selling career on the nation's book counters, it was all things to all critics. To some, it was a pointed social satire. To others, a powerful love story. Some acclaimed its humor, others its pathos. But a story as alive and exciting as H.M. Pullum Esquire doesn't need a label. All it needs is an audience. And tonight, the great audience of radio hears it with two stars who played in the MGM picture, Robert Young and Hedy Lamar. And with them, we have Josephine Hutchinson. Right now, Hedy and Bob are at work in two new Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer productions, Hedy in Crossroads and Bob in Cairo. The same mailman that's been bringing all your requests for H.M. Pullum Esquire brought us a funny little adventure story from a woman who lives on one of the thousand islands in the St. Lawrence River. Yesterday, she writes, we went to the mainland to do some shopping. And as we got ready to come back, many of our purchases were piled on the seat of our skiff. Just as my husband started the outboard motor, a swell from a passing boat made our boat lurch. And several packages, including one of Lux Flakes, went overboard. It happened to fall right above the propeller, and the box was cut in half. In about five seconds, there was a mountain of suds higher than the boat. I, I know you'll be pleased that I informed the audience on the dock that it was Lux Flakes which made those wonderful suds so quickly. Then she adds at the bottom of the letter, P.S., they applauded. Now, here's something for your applause as we raise the curtain for H.M. Pullum Esquire, starring Hedy Lamar as Marvin Miles, Robert Young as Harry Pullum, and Josephine Hutchinson as Kay Motford. <laughs> H.M. Pullum Esquire is a man of 46 years, slightly gray at the temples, and a resident of the Back Bay section of Boston. H.M. Pullum Esquire eats, sleeps, and works on regular routine, as regular as the old grandfather's clock in his front hall. Out of bed at exactly 7.30 each morning, at exactly 8, breakfast, orange juice, one three-minute egg, toast, black coffee. 8.15, walk the dog. 8.30, return with dog. 8.35, start for the office with rubbers and umbrella. At 9 sharp, seated at desk, begin dictation to secretary. Eldridge and Mason, 341 Tremont Street, this city. Attention, Mortimer J. Eldridge. Dear sir, we are in receipt of yours of the 6th instant, and in reply with... Oh. <clears throat> Hello. Yes, this is Mr. Pullum's secretary. It's a Mr. Brown. He wishes to speak to you personally. Brown? There are lots of Brown. The first name is Rodney. I don't know him. He seems to know you. Yeah, let me have it. Hello, who is it? Is that you, Harry? What's the matter with you? It's Bojo. Bojo Brown. Oh, yes, sure, Bojo. <laughs> Hello, uh, how are you, Bojo? Are you so busy you can't talk to old friends? Oh, no, of course not. Uh, how are you, Bojo? Fine, fine. How are you? Oh, I'm fine, too. Haven't seen you for quite a while, Harry. Why don't you ever call me up? Well, you know the way it is. Yes, yes, that's the way it is with me, too. Say, uh, what are you doing for lunch today? For lunch? Uh, nothing. Well, that's swell. Look, how about coming over to the downtown club where we can talk? Why, I'd love to, Bojo. 12.30 sharp. Ridge will be there and a couple of the other fellows from our class. All right, Bojo. Good boy. See you then. Bye, Bojo. Miss Rollo. Yes, sir? I'm having lunch with Mr. Brown at the downtown club. Yes, sir. That was Bojo Brown, All-American Tackle, 1916. We went to Harvard together. <laughs> and now, fellas, I want to propose a toast. To the best darn class that ever was. And to the one that's going to have the best darn 25th reunion that ever will be. 
because you and I and all of us are going to make it that way. Now, remember, Chris, get busy and ask around about talent in the class. Oh, we've got to have lots of good stunts. Well, I've had a swell time, and I hope you all have, too. Goodbye, boys. Goodbye, Oh, uh, Harry, wait a minute. Yes? <laughs> Thought you were getting off easy, huh? Well, you're coming with me, boy. Come along now. Well, I ought to get back to the office, Bojo. Well, it's a great life, isn't it, Harry? Yes. You know, I never realized we were all that old. Well, that's a fine way to talk. We're not old. We're in our middle 40s, Bojo. I'm just as good as I ever was, and so are you. But I see what you mean. Those other fellows, they look terrible. Now, here's going to be your little job, Harry. You're going to be responsible for getting out the class history. Oh, You're to I... get in touch with each one of your classmates and get his life. Now, look here, Bojo. I haven't got the time. Besides, I don't know anything about my classmates' lives. Well, take time. Take off your coat and spit on your hands. It's easy. You can start right in with yourself. That'll give you the hang of it. Everything that's happened to you before Harvard and after. And a few pertinent remarks. Simple as ABC. Well, so long, Harry. I'm late. So long, Bojo. Harry Moulton Pullum. Born December 6th, 1896. 1896. 46 years ago. Sir. Good. I hoped it would be. Oh, Hugh. Yes, Mr. Pullum? Uh, Hugh, just read this over to me in case they don't understand my writing in the telegraph office. Yes, sir. <laughs> Headmaster's office, St. Swithin School, Gerrard's Cross, Massachusetts. Confirming conversation, kindly register my son, Harry Pullum, in class 12 years hence. That's it. Get started right away, Hugh. Yes, sir. <laughs> Born 1896. Entered St. Swithin's 1908. Graduated 1913. Oh, Mr. Pullum, while you were at luncheon, the Mrs. Ransom telephoned. She asked that you call her as soon as you returned to the office. Hmm? What'd you say? A Mrs. Ransom telephoned. She asked that you call her as soon as you returned. Ransom? I don't think I know any Mrs. Ransom. Mrs. John Ransom. She's staying at the Hadley. All right, get it. Yes, sir. Ransom. Mm. I met a Mr. and Mrs. Ransom on my way to Europe. A man named Ransom gave me a bid on putting in a septic tank. Hadley, Mrs. John Ransom, please. Ransom, I don't think I know her. Just a moment, Mrs. Ransom. Here she is, sir. Hello, this is Mr. Harry Pullum. I'm not really speaking, am I, to H.M. Pullum Esquire? Well, this is Harry Pullum. Don't you know who I am? Well, it's probably the telephone. Perhaps there's a bad connection. No, it's Marvin. Marvin Miles. Marvin? Harry, are you trying to pretend you don't remember? Well, well, well what in the world are you doing in Boston? <laughs> I'm here on business until Thursday. You didn't know me, did you? Oh, yes, of course. It's just that, well, you, you came out of nowhere. It's, it's been years. <laughs> don't you want to see what I look like? Yes, I'd like to, Marvin. I'd, I'd love to. Well, then meet me at 5.30 for a cocktail. I'll be waiting for you downstairs in the fiesta room. Harry, are you happy? Happy? Why, yes, of course I'm happy. I'm glad. Ever so glad. You'll be there at 5.30, won't you? I'd love to, Marvin. The fiesta room at 5.30. <laughs> Here, please. This is John Ransom? Yes. A gentleman asked me to bring these flowers to you. Oh. There's a note with him, Mrs. Ransom. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Dear Marvin, you are so beautiful. I saw you from across the room. I just couldn't bear to come in. Our lives are so different, so far apart. You have... I have been married so long. You understand, don't you? Harry. In a minute, King. What are you doing? I'm writing something. Harry, that pipe in the kitchen is still leaking. Now, you forgot to call the plumber again. All right. 
Well, all right, what? All right, I'll call him tomorrow, Kay. And as long as you're still dressed, be sure and take Bitsy for a walk. Ellen may have forgotten. Mm hmm. Harry, what's the matter with you? Why? Well, what are you thinking about? Oh, about my life. Why, Harry, aren't you happy? Yes, of course, Kay. Well, is anything bothering no, you? No, of course not. What makes you ask? Well, you acted so strangely all evening. Well, isn't it all right if I sometimes just sit and think? Yes, I suppose so. Good night, dear. Good night, Kay. Are you happy? Yes, of course I'm happy. I said it just like that. But I wonder if I am. Great Scott, I wonder if I've ever been. Of course, I went to Harvard. I was graduated from Harvard in 1917. I served with the AEF and was decorated for... Mm, no, I can't say I was decorated. That'd be showing off. Let's see, returned in 1919. That was when I met Bill King again. I hadn't seen him since graduation. <laughs> Bill had some funny ideas. All right, go ahead, Harry. Go ahead and tell me how you won the war. Oh, I'd rather not talk about it, Bill. Okay, kid. Funny how some of you fellows act when you first get back. Well, don't worry about it. You'll get over it in a week or two. Yes, I suppose so. When I called the family, I knew I didn't want to hurry back to Boston. I couldn't seem to face going home. I can't explain it. I suppose it's the war. You don't have to explain it. War brings changes, and you've got to change, too. We've all got to change. Even that little beehive up in Boston that you call home. You used to like our beehive, Bill. Oh, sure, I liked it. It was a nice, comfortable beehive. But they're going to smoke it out. Harry, you've got to get out of there. Now, look, I'll, I'll tell you what you do. Write and tell them that you've got a job. I'll get you one tomorrow. Where can you get me a job? Where I'm working, biggest advertising agency in New York, J.T. Bullard, Incorporated. I'm in strong with Bullard. Sit down, Fulham, sit down. Have a cigarette? No, thank you, sir. Oh, he doesn't mean that. He'd like a cigarette, Mr. Bullard. All right. Now, Fulham, William tells me that you'd like to work with us. I hope you've noticed the preposition with us, not for us. We all work together here, one great big team. That's exactly what I was telling him last night, just a great big team. Has he seen Walter Kaufman yet? Uh, what's Walter's reaction? I'll get him. Oh, uh, Mr. Kaufman. Now, Mr. Pullum, uh, let me ask you a question. Yes, sir. Pullum, what do you hope to be doing uh, ten years from now? Ten years from now? Well, I don't know. I guess I... Well, yep, what is it? What is it? Uh, Walter, this is Mr. Pullum. Pullum, how are you, Pullum? Walter, just playing with words, what is your immediate reaction to Mr. Pullum? You mean uh, without any thought? Just snap judgment. Let's see. Uh, something basic there, something basic. Ah, uh, nothing like an immediate reaction. Let me see, today is Wednesday. You might talk to Mr. Pullum, Walter, and have him come in on, uh, on Monday. Uh-huh. See me at 2.30, Pullum. Yes, sir. Yeah, take him along, William. Come on, Harry. Yes, I... This just... way. Thanks, Mr. Bullard. Yes, thanks, Mr. Yeah, good day, Pullum. Listen, Bill. Right over here, Harry. Oh, but listen, they can't hire people that way. Why not? Here's the copy department. That's where we work. You'd better not stick your nose out of it without me. No one better see much of you for a while. Here's our cell. Well... <laughs> What am I going to do? Oh, didn't I tell you? Mm -mm. That's right, I didn't. Well, you're my assistant. Hello, Marvin. Hello. Is that Marine going to come here, too? Sure, the whole U.S. Army's camping here. This is Harry Pullum, Marvin Miles. I'm pleased to meet you. Hello. You see, this is all new to Harry, Marvin. Is he another bullet's ideas? Have you seen what's just been sent in? We're supposed to hang this on the wall. Listen. Let each word, however humble, be an arrow pointed by the barb of thought and feathered with the wings of beauty. Isn't it revolting? Well, I'll tell you, Marvin, I'm responsible for that big thought of today. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Well, if I can't stand any more on an empty stomach, I'll see you later, I suppose. What does she do? Women's copy. You know, I never saw a girl do that before. That is, a nice girl. Do what? Well, while she was talking to us, painting and powdering herself in public. <laughs> Come on, Harry. Kaufman wants to see you. Kaufman? Well, do you suppose he's going to fire me? Of course not. Just act as if you're in a hurry. Here we go. No, no, no. It simply doesn't convey the idea. What idea? 
Listen here, Ellesmere. You're an artist and you drew this picture. That's why you're not looking at it with an open mind. In the first place, I can't see the buttons or the stitching on the coat. May I ask if anyone could see the buttons on a coat at such a distance? We're not paying you for distance. What do you want, Fulham? Well, I was told you sent for me. Oh, yes. Just a minute. Sit over there. No, uh, come over here. Take a look at that picture. Now, here's a completely new reaction, Ellesmere. What do you think when you see that picture? Well, I don't know, sir. I... I don't know what you mean. Uh-huh, that answers it, doesn't it? He sees your picture, Ellesmere, that you're charging us $1,000 for, and he doesn't know what it means. Well, perhaps he hasn't any brains. We're not trying to be intellectual, Ellesmere. Now take it away and do it over. You want to do business with us, you've got to think. Buttons on a coat at 50 feet. One. Well, Pullum, what's on your mind? Well, Bill said you wanted oh, to see... Oh, yes, I'm glad you came in. See Marvin Miles. She has a great idea for a new campaign. You're going to assist her. Well, what kind of an idea does she have? I don't know. Speak to her, not me, but get it out tonight. The client's waiting for it first thing in the morning. All right. That ought to do it. You can go home now if you want. I'm going myself. Oh, there might be something I could do. Yes, in the morning you can go over the grammar of all this and give it a call from my secretary to make a clean copy. Well, good night. See you in the morning. No, I'm going to see you safely home. Oh, don't be silly. You ought not to be out alone so late. Oh? What do you think I usually do? I don't know, but tonight I'm going to see you home. You know, someday I won't have to ride in taxi cab. No? Mm-mm. Someday I'll have a car of my own with a chauffeur waiting outside when I work at night. And I'll have a mink coat and a French maid and then I'll invite you up for dinner. And be sure you wear a white tie because there'll be lots of interesting people. All the writers and artists and people on the stage. I'll be a partner in an agency by then. <laughs> you see? I know I'm good. Yes. I know you are. Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, will you come up? Oh, uh, no, thanks. I'll just see that you get in all right. Oh, don't bother. You've been too nice to me already. Oh, I haven't really. Good night. I think I'll kiss you. Oh, but... <laughs> Good night, Sir Gallahan. Where to, buddy? Oh. Hey, where to? Oh, uh, uh, just any place. It's strange. The events that seem most important in my life aren't things you could put in a class biography. Marvin Miles. She was the most exciting person I ever met. I saw her often after that, in the office and outside. And then one night I was leaving for home to spend the weekend. Marvin came to my room to help me pack. I've always wondered what your room was like. Come on, I'll help you. You're sure to forget something. Well, Marvin, do you really think it's all right for you to be up here? You mean my reputation? Alone in a man's room at night? <laughs> well, it does sound silly when you put it that way. <laughs> well, we can leave the door open if it'll make the landlady happier. Oh, no, that isn't necessary. You know, I don't know what you like at all outside the office. Who is this in the picture? Your mother? Yes, that's mother. And that's your father? Yes. And who is this girl, huh? Somebody you haven't told me about? Oh, I told you about her. That's my sister, Mary. And that's her friend, uh, Kay Motford. Funny. All of you is there, isn't it? In Boston. All you're going back to. <laughs> Must be queer being in two places at once. I don't know what you mean. I wish you were coming along. What would they think of me in Boston? Oh, they'd like you, once they understood you. What is there to understand? Oh, nothing, really. It's just that... After you're used to one type of person all your life, you judge everyone else by that type. You wouldn't understand them either at first. Maybe I would. I understand you. Come on, you'll miss your friend. Well, here I go. Harry, you are coming back, aren't you? Of course I am. I'll be in the office 9 o'clock Monday. You're sure? Of course I'm sure. Kiss me, Harry. Marvin. Harry. Harry, listen. Don't let them keep you, will you? Don't let them take you away. Goodbye, Marvin. Goodbye. Goodbye, darling. Mr. DeMille presents Act Two of H.M. Fulham Esquire, starring Robert Young, Hedy Lamar, and Josephine Hutchinson, in just a moment. Now, here's Mary, back from a week's vacation and showing off her snapshots to the girl next door. This is the dining cabin, and here's the horse I rode. 
And then this is taken from the top of the hill at sunset. Well, they're lovely pictures, but the story behind them is an unhappy one. Of lonely rides and sunsets watched alone, while other girls were finding romance. You see, there's no surer barrier to romance than lack of daintiness. Lux girls know this. They guard daintiness by luxing under things after every wearing. They don't risk offending. Gentle Lux flakes take away every trace of perspiration so quickly, make it easy to be sure of freshness. Yes, it's easy to be a Lux girl, Mary. Try it and see if your photograph album won't tell a happier story. Like this, perhaps. Here's our crowd on a picnic at the lake. And here's Bill with me. He wanted one of us together to take away to camp with him. Yes, romance smiles on Lux girls. They have the charm of exquisite flower freshness. And they win two ways. For those rich Lux suds cleanse so gently, with no harmful alkali, no cake soap rubbing, to injure fabrics or colors. They save delicate fabrics, help them wear better, last longer. So it's thrifty as well as dainty to give under things nightly care with gentle, new, quick Lux flakes. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of H.M. Pullum, Esquire. Starring Hedy Lamar as Marvin Miles, Robert Young as Harry Pullum, and Josephine Hutchinson as Kay Motford. Looking back over his life, Harry Pullum has realized that the important things cannot be written in a class biography. The beginning of his love for Marvin Miles, or the time he visited his home, and his family tried to make him stay. Harry? Harry, where are you? Here, Father. Oh. Well, did you have a good time? Oh, yes, fine. I went to the beach with Kay. Kay Mutford, I'm glad to hear it. It's a good thing to be thinking of the right sort of girl, Harry. I've always liked the Mutfords. Now, look here, Father. That's the second time you've said that since Friday night. I'm not interested in Kay Mutford. I don't want to marry her. Well, someone like her, that's all I meant. You've got to think about marriage sometime, you know. Uh, well, I've got to go back. Harry, wait. You're not serious about going back to New York tomorrow, are you? Well, I have to be in the office Monday morning. When are you going to stop all this confounded nonsense? It won't do any good to argue, Father. All right, we won't go over it again. But I'm hanged if I know. I don't know what's getting into everybody. Well, perhaps around October you'll feel differently. If you're back around October and if your mother's feeling better, perhaps we could go out after Woodcock, eh? When you were born, I thought I'd have someone to pick shooting. Eh, funny, isn't it? Nothing turns out the way you think it will. I wish you wouldn't say that, sir. But it's true. All the things you take for granted. There they are, and then they're gone. And there you were, and now you're gone. I, I don't know how it happened. I wish you wouldn't say that, sir. You make me feel I as though can't I... help the way you feel, and you can't help the way I feel. Good night. Well, you're not angry with me, are you? No. No, it's no use talking. I... I never was any good at talking. Yes, Mr. Kaufman, of course. I'll have the coffee now right away. Marvin. Hello. Well, you got back, didn't you? <laughs> it seems so. Come on, we have to see Kaufman. What did they do to you up there? Who? Oh, everyone. The butler and everyone. Did he unpack your things? Did he say anything about them? No. Oh. Well, he might have said how well I packed your bags. Oh, never mind him. Marvin. Hurry, dear. Remember, Kaufman's always bad on Monday morning. Well, Marvin, I want to tell you something. Well, tell it quickly. What are you looking at? Marvin, I... I... I love you. What? Whatever put that in your mind? I don't know, but just now when I saw you, I... I wanted to tell you. Darling. Well, <laughs> that's all right. I, I love you, too, but there isn't much we can do about it right now, is there? No, of course not, but just the same, Marvin. I... Darling, you've got to learn to keep everything in its place. I'll see you tonight. Stop for me at eight and we'll celebrate. Champagne and everything. Now get your things, darling. Kaufman's waiting. Come in. Hello. And don't leave the door open. I've got a new dress. Wait till you see it. Well... What do you think of it, Mr. Pullum? I think... Uh, I think you're very beautiful. Shall we have some music? All right. Yes, we must have music. And a brand new record, too. Marvin, I want to speak to you. I've been waiting all day for this moment. Oh, you've missed it again, Harry. Missed what? The back of your head. 
Oh. You brush your hair hard in front, and there's always a place in the back you never touch. <laughs> now stand still while I fix it. Well, no. <laughs> now, don't wiggle. Well, you tickle my neck. <laughs> oh, there's such a lot I'll have to do to you. There. Oh, look at your tie. It's always sliding around. Oh, but you're so wonderful in a dinner coat. Like, like a sergeant portrait. Well, I hoped I'd look like uh, Rudolph Valentino. <laughs> you won't know yourself when I get through with you. Oh, darling. Marvin. Marvin, I... I didn't know what you were like at first. And then it sort of all came over me. I... I wish I could say things nicely. You do. You say what you mean. I don't see what you see in me. You wouldn't. It's because I can do so much for you. That's what a girl really wants. Oh, it's going to be like a symphony. You're going to like all the things I like, and I'm going to like all the things you do. I wish I could tell you the way I feel. Uh, when are we going to get married? Why, darling, do you really want us to get married? Why, yes, of course. I was wondering why you were so worried. Now, don't look that way. Of course I want to. But I, I want to be sure that we really love each other. I'm sure I love you. I want you to want to marry me so much that you don't care about anything else. Anything. From now on, I want us to have a good time. I want you always to be happy. And someday we'll have a penthouse overlooking the park. We'll have a living room with nothing but Chippendale in it. And you can take me over to England and I'll buy. I'll want clothes in Paris, too. What do you want? Nothing. I'll watch you buy them. That's because you've always had everything. Come here, sit beside me. Aren't you going to kiss me? Yes, of course. Look, see out the window there, that electric sign? That's my own private little moon. It sells automobiles. <laughs> it's very nice, too. Everything's very nice, isn't it? Marvin, <laughs> why are you crying? Oh, darling, promise me something. Anything. Don't ever leave me. Oh, no, of course not. Just, just try to forget that, that there's anyone but me. Oh, Marvin, Marvin. That was in the summer. In the fall, I received a call from Boston. They wanted me to hurry home. My father was dying. I had never realized before how old he was. Harry. Harry. Hello, Father. I, I just got here. Don't. Don't go away. Oh, I'm not going anywhere, Father. This. This is where you belong. Some man in the house. Stay here, Harry. Stay at home. Yes, Father. We... We never did go shooting, did we? Well, that's all right, sir. We'll get there still. My father died, and I stayed in Boston to take charge of the business. Marvin wrote to me a long letter. I still have it somewhere. She said, My dearest darling, time is such a funny thing without any constant value. It is so dreadfully long now that you and I are not together. I've been thinking of you all day, and I'll think of you tonight, even when I'm asleep. It's so terrible to have someone go. If you and I were ever to quarrel and say we were never going to see each other again, why, I should always think, of course it isn't so. Someday I'll see him right on the street or somewhere, and then you'd kiss me. And I would tell you I was sorry. I would always think that someday, somehow, I could get you back. It won't be long before I see you, will it? Oh, my darling, just remember when you are up there alone that you have someone forever and always, someone you can always come back to, dear, any time or anywhere. I love you so. Come as soon as you can. Don't be too busy. Don't get too lost. In January of that year, I invited Marvin to come to Boston. Bill King brought her. He'd always seemed to like Kay Motford, and I thought it might be easier with him there. Well, 
Oh, oh Marvin, uh, this is Kay Motford, uh, Marvin Miles. Oh, hello, Kay. How do you do? Welcome to Boston. Thank you. Oh, Bill, come over here. I want to speak to you. Secret? <laughs> well, darling? Oh, Harry, this house, it's, it's just what I thought it would be like. Well, I hope you found everything upstairs that you wanted. Oh, yes, yes. Everything's lovely. Uh, when can I see your mother? Oh, tomorrow morning. I think she's resting. Oh, you? Yes, sir? We'll want some ginger ale, you. Yes, sir. Bill, you'd like a highball, wouldn't you? You know me. That's all, you. Yes, sir. Well, what about me? Uh, bring the tray, Hugh. Yes, sir. What? Well, what did I do wrong? Oh, oh it's... Nothing, really. But it might upset things for us to be seen drinking highball. It'll be all right as soon as Hugh leaves. We'll wash the glasses out afterwards. You mean he... he'll smell the glasses? He might, yes. And you don't want to lose your good reputation, do you? Oh, I see. The ginger ale, sir. Well, just put it down, you. May I help, sir? No, that's all. Thank you. Yes, sir. Scotch, Bill? That's it. Uh, how about you, Marvin? Oh, just a drink. A good stiff drink. What's it? Oh, yes, you. I'm sorry, sir. I forgot to tell you. Your mother says she will see you now. Oh, thanks. Come on, Marvin. We'll just run upstairs for a moment. What are you looking at me for, Harry? Is my slip showing? No, I wish it were. It would give Mother something homely to work on. Maybe I have too much makeup on. I'll take some powder off my nose. Oh, no, of course not. You you mustn't worry about Mother. I'm not. You're the one that's worrying. Well, uh, go ahead, dear. Hello, Mother. Harry, dear. Well, Mother, this is uh, Marvin Miles. So sweet of you to come and see us. So kind of you to ask me. I've been reading. Uh, Harry tells me that you read Emerson's essays. Why, yes. Uh, it's so nice to be certain, and not just hope that Harry knows nice girls in New York. Uh, really nice girls in New York. I knew you'd like her, Mother. Now, uh, sit down here near me. Let me see. Uh, there was a Winthrop Miles in New York. Are um, you related to the Winthrop Miles, my dear? No, no, I'm not. You see, I lived there, but I wasn't born in New York. Oh, I see. Uh, Harry's so reticent always. All he said was, Bill King's coming and a girl I know from New York. A uh, girl I know from New York. Uh, look, dear, do you see that picture? Do you know who it is? Why, no. That's Harry when he was five. Well, it wasn't my fault I dressed like that. And here he is at six months. And here he is when he went to St. Swithin's. And here's a lock of his baby hair. Oh, Mother. Oh, I never dreamed that I'd have such a big boy of my own. Uh, Harry, would you take my handkerchief and put just a few drops of cologne on it? Uh, you always do it so nicely. Uh, now, my dear, you must tell me all about yourself. Everything. Well, I, I work for the J.T. Bullet Company. I'm a copywriter there. Oh, <clears throat> how nice. Uh, you and Bill and Harry, uh, all together in that queer place. Now, uh, tell me about your family. Well, when my family came to America, they settled in Illinois. Illinois? Oh, th that reminds me of a little joke. Have you heard about the lady who said she came from Iowa? And then someone else said, oh, yes, but here we call it Ohio. <laughs> uh, uh, well, my dear, <laughs> you mustn't feel that you're a stranger here. I don't, not really. But uh, I'm just a little mixed up, too. It's just like Iowa and Ohio. Next day, we went sleigh riding out near the old summer house. Marvin seemed to enjoy herself very much. When she got cold, I took her indoors. <laughs> no, it's awful cold, isn't it? Well, you may not believe it, but it's warm here in summer. There's white wisteria all along the front porch, and the leaves are out on the silver beaches. Oh, it's such a nice old house. There's a large family of ghosts used to live in the back hall. <laughs> I used to know their ages and their sizes. <sighs> Why, Marvin, are you still cold? Oh, just a little. Well, you're shivering. Harry, you have many ties here, haven't you? This is your home. You're not coming back to New York. You're going to stay here. I know it. Well, if I stay, you're staying too. Oh, I'm afraid there's a bigger difference between Boston and New York than you realize. Oh, people are the same in both places. Are they? Are you sure, darling? Yes. Marvin, 
May I kiss you? Harry. No, no, don't. Oh, darling, I don't want you to go tonight. I don't want you to go ever. Marvin did go. And in a few weeks, I came down to see her. My first evening there, I spent with Marvin up at her place. And here's to you and me, always and always, for years and years. Always and always. Mm. <laughs> you went to the office, didn't you? Uh-huh. Oh, I couldn't bear to meet you there. Not at first, not in front of everybody. I wouldn't have cared. Did you see Mr. Bullard? Bullard? When you were waiting for me? <laughs> well, never mind. See him first thing tomorrow. Not tomorrow. We're getting married tomorrow. Tomorrow? Darling, but we haven't any place to live. Oh, there'll be room till we find some place. Where? Here, in a hotel? Not a hotel. There's plenty of room at home while we're looking for some place. Home? No. No, I couldn't. You belong to me, but no, not there. Not in Boston. Well, it'll only be for a little while until we get a house. Oh, darling. Well, there's nothing to be afraid of, as long as you love me. Oh, but no, not there. We belong to each other here. Everything of you and me is here. Oh, Marvin. Oh, no, I can't. I, I can't. But why, Marvin? I, I thought you liked it in Boston. I hated every minute of it. Then you must hate me, too. No, no, it, it wasn't any of the you I've ever known. You know it. You've tried to get away from it, too. That house where you can't hear any footsteps. That ticking clock. Having to sneak highballs. But you'd have your own house, just the way you wanted it. But I don't just want a house. Oh, I couldn't live that kind of a life. I couldn't join discussion clubs and fuss with curtains. I'd be dreadful at that. There wouldn't be anything left of me. Oh, Marvin, don't. Please don't. Oh, let's try to be sensible. I'm being absolutely sensible. Don't you see... I can't be different from what I am. But that's absurd. No one would want you to be. I won't spend my life pretending. Well, you'd get used to it. But I don't want to get used to it. I have my own life. My own life. But, Marvin, I have my own life, too. I belong at home, and that's where I'm going. I never would fit into a penthouse overlooking Central Park. And I'm not going to be the husband of the women's copy department at Bullard's. I'm not going with you. Do you understand? Yes. I guess it's all over, Marvin. Just like that. Maybe. Maybe it's just as well. You took up a lot of my time. And you took up a good deal of mine. Oh, let's not fight anymore. Well, at least it's something to remember. I guess there's nothing more I can say to make you change your mind. No. All right. Good night, Marvin. Harry! Harry, wait! I want to tell you something. No matter what happens, no matter how long, I, I'll always be waiting for you if, if you want to come back. Goodbye, Marvin. Goodbye. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille returns with Robert Young, Eddie Lamar, and Josephine Hutchinson for Act Three of H.M. Fulham Esquire. In the meantime, let's have a little music. The orchestra is playing a curricadita, one of the latest rumbas. You know, there's a dance that's a lot of fun to do, but it puts a strain on stockings. Well, my stockings can take it. You see, I luck them. That's what pretty Lee Wooten of New York City told us the other day. She's a busy girl. I'm not taking much vacation this summer. I'm going to college. And there's not much vacation for my stockings, either. Especially when I step out dancing with the boys on leave. But I rarely get stocking runs. I lux my new rayons as I do silk and nylon. Gentle Lux Care saves all your lovely stockings. Cuts down runs in silk, nylon, and rayon stockings because it guards their vital elasticity. When you use strong soaps on your stockings or rub them with cake soap, you're weakening the tiny threads, robbing them of elasticity, and robbing yourself of the fine wear good stockings should give you. 
Now, you know that's foolish, when it's so easy to get better wear by luxing stockings after every wearing. Over 90% of the makers of stockings, makers of rayon and cotton, as well as of silk and nylon, advised Lux Flakes. It's care experts advise, and very thrifty care, too. One big box of Lux Flakes will do stockings every night for months. Save precious stockings. Keep them lovely longer with new quick Lux. Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. Act three of H.M. Pullman Square, starring Robert Young, Hedy Lamar, and Josephine Hutchinson. Alone with his thoughts, Harry Pullum reviews his life. All the exciting events of the past, which have led step by step to the unexciting present. He remembers a time just after he parted with Marvin Miles. A day when he went sailing in Massachusetts Bay with Kay Motford. I'm awfully glad you called me up this morning, Kay. You better trim in the jib. You never keep it flat enough. Well, you'd do better if you keep her off a little. Harry. Huh? We're neither of us happy, are we? Well, why do you say that? Well, if you're unhappy, you can tell when someone else is. Everyone around here acts so darn contented. Yeah, I know what you mean. It's no good trying to be different from what you are. Did you ever try it? Yes, I've tried. Well, it doesn't work. No, it doesn't work. Why, Kay, you're crying. <laughs> Don't look at me. I... I'll be all right in a minute. It's just... Oh, I don't know. I feel so futile. Here, you better let me take the boat. It's all such a rut. There's... There's something I've never told anyone. There was a man. Oh, oh no one from around here. He oh. was... Oh, different. I thought he was going to take me away, but he, he didn't even try. Why, well, I never guessed, Kay. Oh, doesn't matter now. But then, there was that girl in New York, wasn't there? Mm -hmm. Well, we're in the same boat, aren't we? <laughs> yes, we're in the same boat. I didn't mean to come out here and make a scene. Do I look all right? Well, you look beautiful. Harry, you never told me that before. Montford and I were married that fall. All summer long, I'd been hearing, here comes the bride. And then at last, after all the excitement, Kay was gliding down the aisle, looking as calm and collected as though she were walking the dog. That night, our wedding night, we were staying at a hotel. Harry. Yes, dear. Harry, sit down. Of course. Harry, I'm not sure whether we love each other or not. What? Well... Wouldn't it be awful if we thought we loved each other and we really didn't? If we only got married because, well, because we were lonely? Oh, I guess everybody feels that way. Don't worry, Kay. Everything's going to be all right. Oh, I don't want to be silly, but I suppose most girls are. Oh, no, you're not. Please kiss me. Of course, dear. Oh, Harry, it's only a little thing, but could you just stop saying, of course? Why, yes, Kay, of course. That was 20 years ago. I'm 46 now. I live in Boston. I work in Boston. I have a boy in St. Swithin's. He's 15, a girl just 12. I sometimes wonder... Harry! Harry, are you still up? Hmm? Huh? Oh, yes. It's 12 o'clock. Did you take the dog out yet? Uh, no, Kay. Harry, is there anything the matter? Oh, you shouldn't have had that highball after dinner. It gives you indigestion. I haven't got indigestion. It's my class biography. I've been thinking about my life. Why, Harry. I've been going over all of it, like adding up a balance sheet. It almost made me frightened. Frightened? I kept saying to myself... What is it all about? But what's what all about? Kay, let's get away from all this, can't we? Just you and I alone, together. Why, Harry, that's awfully silly. We've been married for 20 years. Now, it's a little hard to be romantic, isn't it? 
Well, if we just packed the bag tomorrow morning and took the car and went someplace, any place, and uh, never mind all about the rest of it. Oh, darling, I... I never heard you say anything like that before. Well, it's all around me like a wave. Kate, have you ever really loved me? Well, of course I have. I love our life. It's what we were both made for. Yes, I know, but... Have we ever really loved each other? Have we ever been happy? Of course we have, for years and years. Well, then why can't we ever see each other? Well, do you think we'd be able to see each other any better if we went off somewhere in the car? Yes, tomorrow, Kay. Harry, I can't. Now, you know I have a luncheon engagement tomorrow, and I'm going to judge the flower arrangement competition at the garden club in the afternoon. Kay, if I ask you, please, if I say how much it will mean to me... No, I certainly won't. Now, I'm much too busy to run away into nowhere. All right, Kay, all right. Hello, Mr. Hadley? Miss Marvin Miles, please. Uh, no, I mean, uh, Mrs. John Ransom. Hello? Hello, Marvin. This is Harry. Uh, uh Harry Pullum. You think you have to tell me who you are? Marvin, do you remember what you told me once? That no matter what happened, no matter how long, you... I've never forgotten that. It's been in my mind all the time. It's been with me, too. Well, Marvin? I said I'd be waiting. Well, well, do you think it'll be all right? I mean, if I uh, called on you for lunch? You mean alone? Up here? My reputation? <laughs> oh, Harry, you're just the same. Come over right away. Harry, you know you haven't changed at all. <laughs> Your necktie still doesn't match. <laughs> well, I never could seem to do that with ties. Oh, it's been so long. But it's lasted all the time. Yes. It's lasted. All the little things, they've all been there somewhere. The way your hair never would stay down. Oh, darling, come here. Oh. Hello? Yes, this is Mrs. Ransom. What? Oh, chiseling, eh? No, we won't split the commission with anyone. It's 15% or nothing. Well, if they don't want to sign the contract, send it back. That's definite. They'll sign it. Shall we have some music, Harry? Oh, yes, of course. Oh, by the way, I uh, brought some champagne. Oh, I have some already. Oh? Uh, will you open it? Oh, yes, of course. Harry, listen. Remember? Yes, I remember. I bought it this morning after you called. Remember that night? Yes. You know, no one's ever read me a poem since then. Well... Why should we be standing up? We're not at the cocktail party, are we? <laughs> it's funny. I, I don't seem to know whether we're standing up or sitting down. Oh, careful. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm afraid I spilled a little. Oh, that's all right. Oh, I haven't tasted champagne in years. Never think of it anymore. Neither do I. Well, to us, Marvin. To us. Gosh, that's good. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm sorry. <laughs> you always drank champagne too fast. Well, I always like to get it down. <laughs> Marvin, what are you thinking? Everything is just the same, isn't it? Harry, dear, have you been happy? Yes, I've been happy, Marvin. That is, yes, I've been happy. How about you? Me? Oh, I have a butler and a yacht. Well, I have a boy and a girl and a celium. Why, Harry, how old is he? The boy, I mean. Oh, 15. He's going to St. Swithin's. Well, I, I'd love to see him. Does he look like you? Well, I have a picture of him here somewhere. Oh, yes, here. Oh. Uh, what's his name? George. He doesn't look so good now. He has pimples. Oh, oh he, he looks a little like you. And the girl. Where's the little girl? Right here. Oh, I can't see her very well. Why, why is she burying her head in the grass? Well, she's looking for spiders. Spiders? Yes. She likes to look for spiders. I don't know why. Funny, isn't it? You never met John, did you? John? The man I was married to. He looked like you, a little. I think that's why I married him. Did he? 
Yes. Oh, Harry. Darling. Turn that thing off. All right. Harry, we... We can't go back. I know. I've always had the idea somewhere in the back of my mind that we could. But that's not the way it's meant to be. Whether we like it or not, we've got to go on. And that's that. Yes, that's that. Well, let's have lunch downstairs in the dining room. If that's all right with you, Harry. Well, anything you say, Marvin. Of course. <laughs> Okay, what are you doing down here? Is anything the matter? No, I, I wanted to see you, that's all. Get in the car. Well, has anything happened at home, Kay? No. There's... Well, there's something I wanted to tell you. Miss Rollo said you were out to lunch, but it's after three o'clock. Well, I was at lunch. Harry, you've been drinking. Yes, champagne. Harry, you know what champagne does to you. Oh, it doesn't do anything to me, and it doesn't make any difference if it does. If you must know, I've been having lunch with Marvin Miles. Oh? Is the... Is she as pretty as she used to be? Why, well, yes. That is, uh, almost. I, uh... I canceled all my engagements. Gave up the garden club, everything, to come down and get you. Harry, I've been thinking all day about what you said last night. Whether we'd ever been in love. But we've always loved each other. We've loved each other so much we... Well, we never bothered to talk about it. Well, it's all right, Kay. I, I'll be all right now. Oh, Harry, don't you know that I love you? With you and me, it... Well, it's what love really is. All the days and all the years of you and me together. Well, that's what I meant last night. I know. I know now. Our bags are in the back. Why, Kay... I packed yours myself just the way you like it. But, Kay, well, well, well where would we go? Anywhere. To the Berkshires. The leaves would all be out. Oh, we can't go running away like this. Oh, can't we? Harry, you mayn't have been aware of it, but you've always been in love with me. You know that? It's always been you and me. Yes, I guess you're right. <laughs> I guess that's the way it's always been. You and me. <laughs> Before our stars return for a curtain call, listen to the sad story of a girl named Winnie. She buys smart rayon dresses, but soon she confesses. Oh, dear, I've got nothing to wear. For she tosses her duds into any old suds. The rayons need gentle lux care. Yes, that's Winnie. Winnie the waster. And if, like Winnie, you use just any old suds, you're apt to find that your pretty washables are faded and streaked and ruined too soon. Here's what experts say. And I quote from one of the helpful bulletins sent out by our government. The care you give a dress, whether it's cotton or silk or rayon, has much to do with the way it looks and how long it wears. Wash cottons and washable silks and rayons in warm water, never in hot water. Use a mild soap that will not affect the color and rinse thoroughly. So don't be careless. Not when it's so easy to save pretty washables. Make them wear better and last longer with gentle Lux Flakes. Remember, your smart rayon dresses won't turn into messes. For ages, they'll stay just like new. If you baby those duds with gentle Lux suds, that's the thrifty and wise thing to do. It costs less than a penny to Lux a dress. A new quick Lux takes away soil and perspiration so quickly and safely, with no harmful alkali, no cake soap rubbing, to injure fabrics or fade colors. Get the generous big box of Lux Flakes first thing tomorrow, and give all your washables this gentle, thrifty care. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. A curtain call should follow every performance as fine as H.M. Pullum Esquire. So here are Hedy Lamar, Robert Young, and Josephine Hutchinson. Coming back to the footlights now. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. It's a pleasure to be back. Certainly is, Hedy. Your first visit to the Lux Radio Theater, isn't it, Bob? But not my last, I hope. <laughs> no danger, Bob. You three did a great job tonight. But in these days, there's another job that stars can do for their country. Now, Hedy, suppose the Treasury Department asked you to go out and sell some bonds. How would you do it? 
I might say, please, mister, will you buy a bond? Hetty, you've talked me into it. But I don't think I'd say that. I think I'd say, mister, I personally have seen the Nazis at work in their own country. And believe me, it's worth every dollar you've got to wipe them off the face of the earth. But all our government asks is 10% of your income invested in war bonds and stands. Well, nobody would want you to say please after that, Hetty. And anyone who invests 10% of his income in war bonds and stamps automatically becomes a member of the 10% club and gets a membership button for everyone in the family. Yeah, that's the badge of honor today. I understand this is the last Lux Radio Theater program of the season, Mr. DeMille. Now, the last of our regular season, Josephine. But this summer, our government will sponsor a victory theater to be heard at this same time each Monday. And I believe the Lux Radio Theater received the most signal honor in its history when the United States government asked us to present the first of these programs. Well, what play have you picked to start the Victory Theater? One of the biggest stage and screen hits of recent years, Bob. It's the Philadelphia Story. And our stars will be Cary Grant, Catherine Hepburn, Lieutenant James Stewart, and Ruth Hussey. With Catherine Hepburn as the star, this brilliant comedy ran for many months on Broadway. The picture repeated that success, and next Monday night, you'll hear the same cast that starred on the screen. That's Cary Grant, Catherine Hepburn, Lieutenant James Stewart, Ruth Hussey, and Virginia Widler. Well, the Victory Theater certainly gets off to a great start, Mr. DeMille. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> we'll finish the season in a blaze of glory. I'm going to ask someone else to take a curtain call, too. For the past six years, you've heard his voice every week in the Lux Radio Theater. But this is the last time you'll hear him for the duration of the war. Because he's put on, once again, the wings he won in 1918. Ladies and gentlemen, Captain Melville Ruick of the United States Army Air Force. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. It's been a pleasure to work with you, sir, and with our sponsors during those six years. Duty permitting, I'll be one of those on the other side of the footlights from now on. I know all of those on the other side of the footlights. Now join me in wishing you good luck in your line of duty. As we near the final curtain time tonight, the stage of the Lux Radio Theater is crowded with memories. Memories of glamorous stars and exciting dramatic moments. This is the last regular broadcast of our eighth season. But during the weeks the Lux Radio Theater is off the air, I urge you to listen to the Victory Theater. And in the fall, we'll be back with the ninth season of this theater. That means that for almost a decade now, your friendship for the products behind this program, Lux Flakes and Lux Toilet Soap, has made this national theater possible. And since December 7th, 1941, this theater of yours has had a great new purpose. It has joined with 130 million Americans in one high resolve to help in every way it can the effort of the United Nations to stamp out the Holocaust so treacherously kindled by the enemy. To win the war, that above all, and to perpetuate for all time to come the freedom for which men now are dying. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes and Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the United States government's Victory Theater presents Cary Grant, Catherine Hepburn, Lieutenant James Stewart, Ruth Hussey, and Virginia Widler in The Philadelphia Story. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. <laughs> Heard in tonight's play were Norman Field as Mr. Fulham, Verna Felton as Mrs. Fulham, Fred Mackay as Bill, and Thomas Mills, Jack Mather, Dwayne Thompson, Chris Coffin, Leo Cleary, Charles Seal, and Eugene Forsyth. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been... Melville Roy.
This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.